Hello, I'm John Stuart Gordon, the Benjamin Atmore Hewitt Curator of American Decorative Arts. I'm Ye Chen Zhao, the Marsha Brady Tucker Fellow in the Department of Photography. And welcome to In Search of Gold Mountain, Chinese Immigration and the Gold Rush. And this term, Gold Mountain, is one that we plucked from the history books. Um, this was a term that kind of is a Chinese term that was used to describe Northern California, and in particular, one kind of imagined source of riches. And the image that we used to promote this talk is not actually Gold Mountain, but it is another Gold Mountain in Colorado. Um, is a coin that we have on view here that was minted in Denver depicting Pikes Peak. So I kind of like the idea that this idea of a quest for a Gold Mountain is something that crossed uh, cultural bounds, um, but it really kind of gets to the idea of aspiration and movement as people uh, were traveling to the west coast of the United States in search of fortune and a better life. But let's focus in kind of on, on, yeah, yeah, <laughs> on sure. one particular story. I mean, I mean, like, you know, Gold Mountain is kind of, yes, it's that particular place, but then, you know, even now in Chinese, you refer to San Francisco as Jiujingshan, which is former Gold Mountain. So, you know, yeah, it's like a figurative place, but I think, like, when you talk about it as kind of an imaginative, imaginative land, you know, I think that encapsulates well like why there are so many different people who are after gold. I think that you have this Park City album here, which is a really excellent example of just how many people are and continue to search for stuff in the earth for you know, decades after it was found in California. Yeah, so this exhibition is drawn from Yale's permanent collection, uh, which is extraordinary. And I was able to partner with my colleagues in other departments to look for things um, to help flesh out some of the stories. And one was the story of the gold rush and the search for gold um, that started with the discovery of gold in the Sierras in um, 1848. Um, and this sparked a huge population shift. People came from the East Coast, people came from Latin America, people came from Europe, and people came from China, all descending on this um, one geographic center. And of course, there was going to be cultural tension, there was going to be friction. Um, and it's a story that was kind of tough to tell in our um, permanent collection, which is why I was so glad that Yichen wanted to kind of help bring out a story um, that was only in the periphery. Mm. But in this uh, album that's in your collection, I was thrilled to find depictions of the actual miners. Um, so to remind us that th there really were people here. Mm -hmm. um, the gold just didn't mythically arrive out of the ground. It didn't kind of magically turn into coinage and um, coinage and objects, but there were people here. So this is Park City, uh, Utah. This is a town that grew up in kind of silver mining, there was a little gold mining, and this page um, shows the Ontario mine, which mined gold, silver, lead, and tin, and miners from the Ontario mine about to go into the shaft. Yeah, I mean, you know, fittingly, like, they're wearing masks of a different kind, which I thought was fun to flag. But, um, you know, this album is 1891, so actually by that time, um, you know, the gold rush had more or less been over, so it makes sense that it's a silver mine, but you know, it's great that it's in the photography collection because photography becomes incredibly silver-based at that time. George Eastman registers uh, his company Kodak in 1888 and becomes a huge silver speculator himself. So there's very much a way in which this is a book about mining, it's a book about these patterns of immigration, and really kind of like a total reorientation of the world, you know, in the way that you said, John, like people are coming to the United States, but then also things need to go elsewhere, this gold is going places around the world, and when you bring up the fact that there are these miners photographed, you know, like I, I think it's like very obvious to point out, oh, well, they're mostly white people. And, mm -hmm. you know, like this is, this is fine. Like that's normal. Like this is the sort of thing that would like fund photography is like people who have the money to get photographed. Something that, you know, I think about in relation to the Chinese immigration and gold rush is the fact that, oh, well, why aren't there any Chinese miners photographed? And a lot of that has to do with you know, um, their, sense of, their sense of self is imposed by, um, you know, their white peers um, and a kind of feeling of photography as a tool of surveillance. So, you know, like when the Chinese Exclusion Act is passed in 1882 and then it gets strengthened a couple years later, there's this move to have uh, certificates of residence, which would have their name and their photograph and like other details about every Chinese person living in America to be like, you know, you're supposed to be here. 
And actually, the California Historical Society in San Francisco uh, is opening a show. They may have opened it already, which includes a book they have of like a town constable in Downeyville, California, who it's like 140 photographs of Chinese people who live in his town and just keeping track of their whereabouts. So there's a very real way in where it's like you don't really not interested in being photographed as an individual. Yeah. Like you might be around, but um, it's actually like you know kind of a question of like your own attitude towards individuality. Another thing to think about too is like you know there's not good record keeping. You know, there's kind of this side effect of racist record keeping where, um, for example, railroad supervisors would just write everybody's name as the name of the business that subcontracted their labor. So mm -hmm. there's just a way in which like, it's really hard to individualize these, these miners. Um, but that's not to say that they're not present or that you can't find them. It's just that they are not straightforwardly represented in the same way as like this album does. It's an interesting uh, kind of sidebar about just even the history of photography uh, within a museum. This, this medium that is artistic, it's experimental, but it does get used as kind of surveillance and documentation mm -hmm. very early on, and yeah. then only later is kind of reappraised as um, kind of standing alone as kind of an art object. So this yeah. book is kind of toggling those histories. Yeah, yeah. And I think like this album in particular too, like has a certain you know, attitude towards individualism and the individual that really sort of demonstrates how like, um, you know, racial politics shape that, like you know, who is going to be a person in their own right. Mm -hmm. I think actually like in that way, it'd be really, you know, we, could, we could segue to the spoon because I feel like that's like a kind of great way. I think that this exhibition is really excellent because objects, I think often more than photographs, can be really interesting ways to tell stories of individuals rather than groups. They have a kind of particularity to them you know, they've changed hands, they've been in different places. That feels a lot more, well, you just really straightforwardly tangible than, uh, you know, photographs. Great. Yeah. So let's turn to the spoon. Let's do it. So I thought it would be nice to move to another object in this case, which I was really taken by this story that you told me about it. And I think it will be a kind of way to set up an interesting counterpoint, like what happens at the beginning of the gold rush? Like what is going on when gold is discovered in California? So I would really love to, you know, sort of hear that story shared again. Of course. So this story focuses on a, a, a common looking tablespoon, but wrought from an amazing material, a solid gold tablespoon. And the story is in the months following the discovery of gold in 1848, a city kind of grew up overnight, um, restaurants, hotels, but also banks and assay houses, the kind of companies that weigh and define the pureness of gold and then turn them into coinage. And there's a young man um, named Samuel Ward, who is a recent college grad. He goes to work for Moffat and Company, one of these assay houses in New York, and they quick ship him off to San Francisco to open up the West Coast branch of, of their company. So this young man is in this kind of, kind of unmoored city that's still finding its footing. And they very quickly become the most reputable assay house, um, working with good craftsmen um, to turn gold into coins. And, and the next year in 1849, he sends home to his mother in Middletown, Connecticut, a solid gold spoon. And on the handle is written his initials and it says to his mother and then on the back is engraved made of native gold san francisco california 1849 so this complicated story like, i love that fact it's native gold so it's very kind of a claiming mm -hmm. um kind of this like patriotic statement that this is like american gold yeah. this is part of like you know Bishop Barclay's, you know, westward the course of empire takes yeah. command, and you know, here this material is found within mm -hmm. American shores, but it's traveled a huge distance. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, you know, the fact that this happens within a few months, you know, he goes there, and then like a year later, he sends gold back. Like, gold leaves the country just as quickly. Mm -hmm. I mean, in December of 1848, the first California gold arrives in Hong Kong, and it's used to pay for a shipment of supplies that are coming from Hong Kong through Hawaii to San Francisco. It's a guy who's working for the Hudson's Bay Company. Wow. And on that ship also comes newspapers which explain like, hey, in California, they've already dug $4 million worth of gold out of the ground. 
Um, and so like just as quickly as you know, Ward gets over to the West Coast, like the Chinese are coming too. And actually, like, this is sort of an, an, a nice way to ex like, explain that you know, a lot of the, pretty, the majority of the immigrants who are coming to mine gold from China are from this one area of Guangdong province in China. They're from the Pearl River Delta, which had been for many you know, centuries, like already this kind of booming market economy. And also, you know, it's a place where there's a lot of water, which is important. We'll get to that in a second. Um, but there's like this perception that is advanced by um, John Bigler, actually one of California's governors, that you know the Chinese are coming over as coolies, that they're coming over like sort of as indentured servants or hard labor, they're being pressed into doing it. But a lot of the people who are coming over from the sea province, uh, sea cities rather, um, they are like war. They're sort of like their families are have some means and they're kind of investing. They're like, look, if you go out there, you make a lot of money, uh, you can come back, and then we'll all be fabulously wealthy. Um, Maxine Hong Kingston's book Chinaman, which is really fantastic, has this story where um, you know a bunch of people in the village have decided we're going to go again, and so then they dig up the last generation's maps, notes, immigration papers, and like if we're going to we're going to go to Gold Mountain and hit it up again, you know. So like they're not sending gold spoons back to Hong Kong, but there's the same kind of attitude. It's like this is a entrepreneurial activity that. If, if it works out for us, it's gonna be great. And so like, you know, the Chinese are there for the same reason. Yeah, and I like this object because it does show the two sides of it, because it's definitely a show of, of material success, mm -hmm. but it's also deeply emotional. Uh, yeah. Because the Ward family was not well off, and I found the probate inventory for Nancy Ward Skinner, the mother, and this wasn't in the kitchen, it wasn't in the dining room, it was in her bedroom and uh, it was one of the highest value objects in the house. <laughs> so this uh, was about financial success, but also like, hey, yeah. you know, we, we made it, and yeah. we, were, we, were, we were successful. Well, this relationship between the son and the mother, I think, is really important also to highlight a distinction, is that because the majority of people coming from China are men, mm -hmm. but they're all coming from you know, like the same village, the same family, there's these enormous kinship structures that are, that are shaping how the Chinese come over to the United States. And like, you'll find that in the gold fields, for example, it'll be like you know, 10 guys all from the same village. It'll be like you know, someone, his uncle, his great uncle, things like this. And that you know, really shapes how Chinese uh, social groups form in the United States. You may know about like in San Francisco, there's like the benevolent associations, you know, those are mm -hmm. hui guan, which is like a mutual aid society for people. Just like, oh, well, if you want to come to San Francisco, we'll help you out, we'll get you a place to stay, we'll get you your gear, and then you can get out. Um, but, you know, that still to this day is such a huge part of San Francisco, um, you know, Chinatown. Yeah, and that history actually, I mean, almost most insurance companies in this country kind of come out of that benevolent society model mm -hmm. where you, you look after your own and you help them um, kind of thrive. So we've talked about kind of documenting gold uh, excavations, objects made of gold, but let's turn to some of just the raw material itself. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think that's like a way to talk about I think like the labor aspect of this, which is like what are, you know, what is actually being done to get gold out of the ground? And like, there's so much you can learn about this. But I, I think it's really interesting to point out that like gold mining is a bit of an artisan process. You know, it's mm -hmm. not like silver mining or copper mining where you're necessarily like using huge machines. Like the first miners are just using pans and then they use the rockers. And so like, actually these two gold crystals are really, really amazing to look at because I think more than the, the portrait of the miners in the album is like, this feels to me more like a group portrait. There's this kind of, you know, a lot of cooperation goes on between Chinese miners. One, because they can't um, preempt land like white miners can, so like they can't just say, this is my spot. They all have to kind of collectively show up and sit there, um, and then that land becomes theirs. But because they're based in these kinship structures, they have a lot of cooper they like literally form mining cooperatives. So there's this kind of amazing apocryphal story of like a big gold crystal being split into 40 chunks by the co-op that found it. And so, you know, like, of course, you know, who knows how these ones came about, but I do look at these and like, this is really kind of like an index of the history and the work that goes into getting this out of the ground. 
And so these are uh, believed to have been sourced in the 1850s in Placer County, which is in um, Northern California, just kind of connecting Sacramento to Lake Tahoe, for those people who know that geography. Um, and they're exceptionally beautiful, and they've probably survived because of their beauty. Um, but we don't know much of the origin story or the, the townships that kind of grew up around this mining apparatus. But I, you told me a great story about some work you've done um, oh, yeah. kind of thinking about what are these, you, you know, if, what are the kind of the community structures that are built yeah. to support this kind of mm -hmm. plaster mining? So, I mean, I think the first one to talk about is very fittingly a place called Chinese Camp, which is a place that you'll pass if you're heading to Yosemite. Um, and that is not far from the first mining party to head up to the Sierras, which is actually um, English, Chinese, and Sonorans. Um, it's an English man who subcontracts Chinese in Hong Kong to come to the United States, Shanghai, sorry. Um, and then they get there, and there's already some Sonorans there, and the English and the Chinese don't know anything about mining. Uh, and so they hire one of the Sonorans to teach them. Um, and, you know, they get good at it, gold starts coming out of the ground, and then well, the white people are like, well, we don't want you digging with us anymore, the Chinese. And so the Chinese kind of move off and they find their own spot. Um, and I'd mentioned water before, the Pearl River Delta. Everyone mm -hmm. who is coming from China, they're very good at water engineering. And water is maybe like one of the most important things to do when you're, when you're mining gold is you need water to just wash it clean and see what you have. And so Chinese camp starts in a place that is not near a source of running water. Um, but is nonetheless a place that has a lot of gold. And so the Chinese are sort of like willing to put up with the fact that they have to carry the diggings a little bit further to wash them out. But then like because no one else wants to go to that trouble, they are able to form this community there. And I think like, you know, it's a thousand people by 1851 and at its wow. peak it's, you know, 5,000 people. It's Chinese, it's Chinese businesses, but they serve both Chinese and white travelers because it is in such like a central location. Um, it also, you know, I had mentioned like San Francisco is called Old Gold Mountain now. At the time, it was called Big City, and then Sacramento is called Second City, and then um, Marysville, which is another town north of Sacramento, is called Third City. Like there, are, there are Chinese, there's Chinese all over the place in the Central Valley, and they have their own, you know, ways of making money. Like it's not just in the gold fields, but like you know, after a while, people are working there as agricultural laborers. And because the Chinese are really sophisticated water engineers, once they start doing hydraulic mining, which as you know is like the blasting the side of the hills with, with water, um, mm -hmm. a lot of Chinese work as engineers for those companies. And in fact, like continue to do that even after hydraulic mining is essentially outlawed in 1884. I love the idea of thinking about kind of these objects as group portraits and kind of like thinking about kind of the, the um, the connections of not just this object as a piece of valuable material, but all the hands that have touched it, and you know how it was extracted, and the kind of the, the paths it, it took from coming out of the ground into water, into someone's hand, into a pocket, into a bank. Yeah, and it like you know it makes its mark too in these places, like especially in Marysville, say, and Oroville, which are both places um, in Placer County. Mm -hmm. um, there are temples there still standing. Um, Marysville, you know, speaking again of water, Marysville is next to the Yuba River, as you know, which started flooding all the time because of the hydraulic mining they were doing. But, you know, there's enough Chinese people making money there that they not only have like a little Chinatown there, but they build a temple, um, which is called Bokai or Bei Miao. Um, and the, the deity that is most commonly, uh, you know, worshipped there is a deity of the water. It's like a deity of the elements. And so like, it's a big deal, you know, it makes a lot of sense. And actually, to this day, you can still go there and pray. Um, the, the, family, the family lives there, they open it once, uh, once a week on Saturdays. And you were able to visit it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was kind of like a nice happenstantial thing um, that they were open on that day. But it was like really kind of, it's funny because like it's next to a saloons themed restaurant, a saloon themed restaurant. So there's like, you know, this, the, 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 the myth of the West is repeated again and again. But it is like really amazing. I mean, that building is like, you know, almost 150 years old at this point. And it's like one of the few kind of remaining traces of Chinese settlement. Um, because, you know, 
yes, the Chinese are not being photographed. There's all these kinds of oblique ways to talk about you know, their presence in the historical record. But there is also you know, a huge history of just their removal and their erasure. You know, the Chinese Exclusion Act is the only race-based immigration law that's been passed in this country. And it was in effect for, I think, like 50 years until like 1962. And yet in the landscape, um, that there are, so there are the few extant temples next to the, 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 the saloon-themed restaurant, which is fabulous. Um, but then there are also markers on the landscape. And there, the, there is a memory on the landscape, even yeah. though um, much of it is yeah. the actual buildings and structures have been erased. Well, so there's been a lot of discussion about that in recent years. I mean, I've traveled to, for example, the site of Sutter's Mill, and they have you know, two shops there that are owned by, that were owned by Chinese proprietors. But they also mentioned, you know, there's like, hey, in the 1880s, all the other Chinese buildings here burned down. And if you go up and down the Pacific coast, that is like sort of overwhelmingly the case. It's like in the 1880s, when the Chinese Exclusion Act is passed, there is just this huge push to drive the Chinese away. And so there are very few kind of like structures that remain. But in the way that you say is, yes, there's a lot of like sort of visible marks in the land. Of course, like, you know, the hydraulic diggings is one, but um, for example, recently, uh, the city of Antioch, California, apologized to its Chinese residents for essentially being a sundown town, which is like you can't, you know, be a non-white person after 3 p.m. And um, the Chinese there had built an elaborate system of tunnels to get between home and work, and some of those still exist. You can actually see something kind of similar to this up in Folsom. They have the Folsom diggings, which are these, you know, I've, I've, you can climb into them. They're next to a big movie theater, a strip mall. You know, again, this is like this is where these things are preserved. But they're, you know, it's, it's higher than your head, and you're just in these like narrow tunnels. And it's extraordinarily quiet and cool there too, as you know. Central Valley, California, is really hot. Yeah. But there are like these real like, you know, parts of the land that have you know just retained that trace. I think like the one that really moves me is. Um, I went to Nevada City, which is um, pretty close to Grass Valley, um, which is another big gold mining site. And, and a couple years ago, they paid for a plaque, the Chinese American Association there, that just says something to the effect of like, you know, uh, to, the Chinese, to the Chinese miners who have been here whose footprints are always left in the landscape or something like that. And I think like that's kind of really moving and beautiful because, you know, yeah, there is no like portraits, you know, there's no painted picture of, there are some, but like there aren't, you know, an overwhelming number, but there are so many other ways beyond just like a kind of straightforward depiction of a Chinese person that this history of immigration remains in the landscape. Yeah, I like that idea that it's not necessarily absent stories, just stories that we um, need to ask the right questions to, to bring out. Cause, yeah. Because all of these stories are coded in, in the objects and, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and when, you don't know whose hands these things have been in and how they've intersected with people's lives. Yeah, I, I think like, you know, well, you couldn't create a show of just pictures of Chinese people because you'd have like, you know, just a few stereo cards by Carlton Watkins or something like that. Um, but this is a way to ask really kind of important questions and also, you know, acknowledge this kind of mixture of real suffering, like undeniably, like, you know, this, like, you know, some, some like 50, some Chinese people were killed in the 1870s just getting driven out of towns. You know, there's a whole history of, of exclusion, of violence. You know, it's actual, it's really hard work too. Mm -hmm. But there's also, you know, it's not just a sob story. Like, as I mentioned before, these people are coming here because they want to make money. They're trying to like build a life for themselves. And I think like when I came to this country in the 90s, I had like no real consciousness of like, there being other Chinese immigrants before me, because you're like five, so you have no like sense of self in that way. But like going to these places and like learning more about this was, you know, really meaningful to me because it's like this has been happening for a long time. And in fact, like the world that I entered when I when I did, like had already been shaped by this and like already, you know, had this kind of sphere of sphere of development. And I think like that was really important for myself to kind of grapple with and think about. Well, thank you so much for sharing personal stories, but also these um, great historical stories that add so much depth and texture to thinking about gold as a material and the experience of um, Chinese immigration and all of those who were in, 
populating the American West. Yeah, I mean, it's the memory part of the show, right? I mean, I, I would also be remiss in saying, like, a lot of my own knowledge of this comes from reading two really excellent books, mm -hmm. one by Gordon Chang, who's a professor at Stanford, um, who's written a book about called The Ghosts of Gold Mountain, and then Mei Nai, uh, Mei Nai who uh, teaches at Columbia and who wrote a book called The Chinese Question, which just came out last year, I think, which is kind of like a holistic look at Chinese immigration and gold mining across the world. Wonderful. So we have some sources for further reading, and we invite you to come see the objects in person before the exhibition closes on July 10th. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you.